Well, what we're going to talk about uh, today is um, a background on GWT for those of you who haven't seen it before. Uh, why do we use GWT to build rich web apps? And then we'll talk about some of the developer tools that are part of your toolkit, um, how GWT can improve performance of your applications for users, and then if we uh, hopefully we'll have time at the end for a few GWT secrets, tips and tricks kinds of things. So just by way of review, Google Web Toolkit is a tool for writing rich web applications. And why are we interested in rich web applications? Well, it's because speed matters on the internet. And so if in a traditional server-side application, every page represents a new request to the server, every click requires a new request to the server, then you're not able to write a highly dynamic, responsive uh, application. So Google Web Toolkit is a way to write apps for the web that feel more like a desktop app, and to write this not in JavaScript, but in Java. Let's think about some of the sources of slowness that we have in our applications. You know there's bandwidth may be limited between your app and the server. Browsers limit the number of connections that can be made simultaneously to a server. And then there's latency in the network as well. Browser limits are usually two, sometimes four or six open connections so that every time you go retrieve an image, you're using an open connection. So there's only so many things you can do at the same time in the browser, retrieving data and images. And round trips are costly because they often traverse uh, large spaces of network and even at the speed of light, users can perceive a difference of 10 milliseconds. So in a typical server-side app, you have your initial DNS lookup, a round trip for the HTML page, possibly a redirect, a trip for each image, each cascading style sheet, each JavaScript, all of these things are introducing latency into your page's load time. And then each subsequent click. You can see this using Chrome developer tools and other, other uh, tools like uh, the web developer. Well, what am I thinking of? There's a Firefox plugin. It escapes me at the moment. But Chrome developer tools will show you all of the resources that a web page uses, and you can look in either the time or the size, and it will show you exactly uh, how big each resource is and the latency that's inherent with that resource. So why do we use GWT? It's to radically improve the web experience by allowing you, developers, to use Java tools to build no compromise, rich client web apps. GWT's sweet spot is when you want to build an application that feels like a desktop application, but runs in a web browser. So now that the room is almost full again, let me ask again, how many people have used Google Web Toolkit? OK, about a half, I would say. Uh, how many people? have a general idea of what Google Web Toolkit does. Oh, there's a few people who didn't raise their hands. I must not be speaking clearly enough. <laughs> All right. So it's a Java to JavaScript compiler. Now, why would you want to use that? We'll look at that in, in just a minute here. Um, let you write rich web applications in the Java language. Also, GWT allows cross-browser code to just work. How many people like writing JavaScript that's specific to each browser? Right, me too. That's why I use GWT. Okay, it produces very small and fast JavaScript, and we'll talk about some of the optimizations that the GWT compiler makes a little bit later. And GWT also gives you a very easy and efficient mechanism uh, for remote procedure calls to communicate with the server. So GWT browser proofs your code. Um, it doesn't require any plugins, unlike Flash 
or Silverlight, it runs directly in the browser as JavaScript. And it allows you to write apps in Java. Now, why, why do we want to write our web apps in Java? We can get an idea uh, from looking at this example. Can anybody find the bug on this, on this page? Yes? Okay, maxi num is uh, in there. You get some uh, points for the Google Developer Day store. Exactly. Now, for those of you who can't see your spelling errors that fast, <laughs> we might like to write it in Java so that, whoops, the IDE will detect our spelling errors for us. The issue is we didn't declare the, we, we typoed the maximum variable name. So this is just one example of why you would want to use Java. Other reasons are to get the benefits of code completion and also the ability to use all the refactoring tools um, as, as well as see the Java doc. It's just much nicer to write code in Java than JavaScript. So how could we have the best of both worlds? Could we write our code in Java but have it run in JavaScript in the browser? Yes, we can. That's, that's what GWT is all about. So you might ask, well, what companies in the world actually use GWT for large public-facing applications? Can anyone think of a company that might use GWT for large public-facing applications? Hey, okay, who said Google first? Let's see, we need, we need to give away some more uh, points here. <laughs> All right. Yes, at Google, we do eat our own dog food, as we say in the United States. The AdWords front end was recently written in GWT, and if you think about Google's business model, the AdWords interface is our cash cow. That's where we make money, um, besides Android, selling ads. Also, the Google Maps product, uh, Google Docs, the new interface to groups, if you've seen that, and Google Wave, may it rest in peace, uh, all use GWT as well in different places within those products. So this is a very a widely used product. There's more products inside Google all the time that are writing in GWT. Something that's important about that for you as a developer, if you're going to use a toolkit, especially one that does something uh, difficult and challenging, like compiling Java code into JavaScript, you would like to know that there's gonna be some support behind it and that as new browsers come out, that GWT is going to support those new browsers and new browser features, et cetera. And the point that I want to make is that there is only one GWT. We don't have a different version inside Google and outside Google. Everything that we do inside Google to make GWT work better for Google applications, we check into the Subversion repository that's publicly available. It is open source software. So all the work that Google does to keep Google's apps running that use GWT, you get for free as an open source um, user of the software as well. Here's some more companies uh, that are using GWT, and here are some of the interfaces that have been built with the products. You can do very rich applications with it. And I want to do a quick demo here of one application uh, that's been written recently that's hosted on App Engine as well. This is an app for hair salons to do their scheduling. And really, it could be used by any uh, customer scheduling type of business. So you can see that uh, it has a nicely styled user interface here. Hopefully the internet is still working. It was working two minutes before I started speaking. Let me also correct the uh, error that I've made in the username and see if that helps.
Well, it appears that that demo is not going to happen. <laughs> At least not right now. Sorry about that. I do. I am plugged into the wired internet, but it appears to be down, so we'll go on. There is um, a marketplace of applications around GWT as well. You'll find all kinds of open source projects online, um, a lot of them hosted at Google Code. And somebody recently created this GWT marketplace in which you can find a lot of those third party libraries who's using it. Uh, because it's open source, it is a very extensible. There's a product, uh, for example, that does Gwit drag and drop. Um, Fred Sauer, who is here, actually in this room, in the back, uh, wrote that. Uh, Gwit log as well is Fred's uh, brainchild. Gwit voices allows your browser to speak. Um, not speak like I'm speaking, but make music and sound, play sounds through the browser. And then Gwit FX is uh, just one of the many visual effects libraries that do transitions and animations and fade in, fade out, things like that. So there's a, there's a lot of things like this. Uh, Gwit Movable Toolkit is a project that right now offers GWT widgets that implement browser HTML5 capability, like the geolocation uh, tags are now available as a GWT widget. Uh, there's a lot more mobile support coming in in later versions of GWT that will be built in as well. GWT is about four years old. It was introduced in 06, and since then has become quite popular. Uh, there's about 24,000 people on the GWT users mailing list, and the versions of uh, GWT, each one that we publish is downloaded over 100,000 times, typically. So there's a lot of people using it and building very large applications with it. In fact, a lot of companies tell us that they really can't imagine building a large, rich web app without GWT because of the manage manageability that writing Java code gives you. Uh, just three weeks ago, we released GWT 2.1, which brings a whole um, bunch of new features, support for the model view presenter pattern built into the framework, a new service layer called the Request Factory, and then integration with Spring Roo, which Fred demoed uh, in the keynote this morning. So the two main goals that GWT has are to make you more productive as a developer and then to improve the responsiveness of your applications for users. So I'm going to take the remaining time, break into those categories, and talk about how GWT can help. The Google Web Toolkit gives you tools for the whole development lifecycle. So you write your code in Eclipse with the Google plugin for Eclipse. You debug also in Eclipse. We'll show that in a moment. Then you can use Speed Tracer, uh, which is written by the GWT team. It's a Chrome extension that will show you in very detailed view exactly how much time is being spent in the browser processing the JavaScript, parsing it, et cetera. And then finally, you can use Google Plugin for Eclipse or Maven to deploy your code to App Engine or to any server in the cloud. Sorry. So Google Plugin for Eclipse gives you a lot of different uh, capabilities. You have, if you're writing JavaScript native methods, there actually is uh, code syntax highlighting and code completion for that. There are, uh, are wizards to help you run, compile, and, and deploy the code. You have quick fixes for things like creating RPC services. And in general, it is the, it is the the place where you're going to prefer to do GWT development. Uh, also, very importantly, is the debug mode, which allows you to uh, see your code and just hit refresh in the browser and then see your changes right away. We'll demo that here in a second. The Eclipse plugin is also the easiest way to get the latest um, GWT and Google App Engine SDKs because you just install them using the normal help update mechanism that you use uh, in Eclipse. How many people use Maven? Wow, okay, I'm glad we added some Maven support. <laughs> Are you glad we added some Maven support? <laughs> I hope so. This is uh, 
something that's just really happened in the 2.1 time frame that we've made all of the GWT jars available in the Maven Central repository. And then we're also working closely with the Gwit Maven plugin project people to uh, make it work better in Maven. Another uh, part of your toolkit now for developing applications is the GWT designer. And this is from the instantiations company that Google acquired a few months ago. And we made it available for free. The UI designer works, it can create both Java files as well as the XML UI binder templates that look something like this. So this UI binder was, I think, last year, GWT 2.0 gave you the capability to write your interface in a traditional HTML-like XML file. Otherwise, before that, it was Java, new widget, etc. The GWT designer also gives you a nice CSS editor with a visual preview capability, which um, is actually hard to do in Eclipse otherwise. There aren't, it's not built into Eclipse, so this is a, a good development tool for you as well. So let's take a look at the development cycle with GWT. I have a quick demo here which does not depend on the internet. It does, however, depend on my ability to turn my head backwards and see the external desktop. We have a this, this is the sample greeting project when you install the Google plugin for Eclipse. If you say new web application, then it will create this greeting project for you. And it just has some simple UI code and an example of a, servers, a service call. So let me uh, go ahead and just get this fired up. This is the run web application button. And what it will do is start our built-in Jetty server and then you'll get this development mode tab where uh, it will be waiting for you to make changes and then refresh in the browser. All right, let me stop that and try that again because I'm not getting what I was expecting to get. Run as web application. Not sure. This also was working two minutes before the demo. There it is. All right. Computers really do have a demo mode, but it's hidden from you until you actually do a demo, and then you learn about it. OK, so I, I got a uh, URL there in development mode that I'm going to copy into my browser. And what it's now doing is loading up our application that's actually running inside of Eclipse. OK, so here is what the starter project looks like. We have a button that says, say hello. We click on it. It makes a service call to the server, also running on our Jetty server on our machine. And we get back uh, a message. So let's go make a change now to our code. Instead of say hello, I'm going to make the button a little friendlier and make it say hi. So we'll just change our button text here and hit save. And then go back to the browser, click refresh, and you can see that it's changed our button text for us right away. So if you think about what GWT is doing, we didn't have to do a step of compiling to JavaScript just to see our change. Or if we did do that, it happened so fast that it didn't matter. But it turns out, actually, that we didn't have to do that. Because GWT development mode lets you write your, lets you test your changes 
in Java running in the Eclipse environment. And there's two pieces that are necessary to make this work. You have the uh, code server running inside of Eclipse, which is plugged into the Eclipse JVM. So it's actually running your Java code as Java code inside Eclipse. And the code server communicates with a plugin, the GWT development plugin for the browser. And it works for um, all the Windows browsers, Chrome and Firefox on Linux, and Chrome for Mac is coming very soon. So you have a plugin in the browser that communicates with the code server, and the two working together are smart enough to be able to run your Java code, but then actually manipulate the browser's document object model on the fly, just as if you were running JavaScript in the browser. So this makes it very quick to uh, develop your applications. Now, because we're running in Eclipse, we can also use the Eclipse debugging capabilities. So I want to demo that as well. We'll stop our run server here, and instead we will click, well, let's set a breakpoint first, somewhere on a, a button click handler. There we go, line 94. Make sure our breakpoint set. So when we click on the button, we're going to stop the code at that point. We'll start the debug server here. Yeah. Look at our development mode tab. The URL we already have, it's in the browser, so I'll just flip over there and hit refresh. And now it's loading up our application again in dev mode but with the debug server in Eclipse. So when I click on the button, it will actually take us to the uh, trace of that line of code stopped in Eclipse, just like you normally do when you're debugging. So now we can step through the code just like we would ordinarily uh, in Eclipse and have it step through line by line. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? We're doing uh, debugging of Java code running in the browser. So you're actually able to debug code that will ultimately run in JavaScript, but inside the browser uh, using Eclipse. I think that's, that's a pretty good little wizardry that the GWT team has put together. And it makes it very productive to develop rich web applications. When you're finished debugging, then you compile your app for production. And this is just running the GWT compiler, which you can launch easily from the uh, toolbar and Google plugin for Eclipse. And then it will package it up as a standard war structure with all of your style sheets and images, uh, and of course your JavaScripts uh, that the GWT compiler creates. After you've compiled it and put it in a browser, you can optimize it and find out using Speed Tracer exactly which features uh, are taking the most time, and then you can work on further optimizations. So Speed Tracer is built, um, oops, sorry. But you can launch it uh, from Chrome directly as an extension, or you can launch it from Eclipse using the new uh, Chrome Speed Tracer button in Eclipse in the latest version of the Eclipse plugin. If you launch it from Eclipse, there will also be integration with Speed Tracer so that anytime it shows you a line of JavaScript code in Speed Tracer, it will actually give you a hyperlink that you can click on that and it will take you to the corresponding line of Java code in Eclipse. So it also uh, is aware of the mapping between the two. Speed Tracer also has now the capability to look at server-side speed traces on two platforms. So in addition to see um, your paint and layout operations and JavaScript operations on the client, you can see what's going on in App Engine. We have integration with the App Engine App Stats capability. So in this example, we can see we're doing some memcache gets and a data store get, um, and we're seeing that right in our client using Speed Tracer. It's one view of the whole request, client, 
server all the way through. It also works with the Spring TC server. Does it, how many people, just out of curiosity, are using Spring TC server? A couple in the back, okay. How about App Engine? More. Okay, good. And then finally, when you're finished uh, with your WAR file, you're ready to deploy it for the public, then you can easily deploy to Google App Engine by just clicking the App Engine button in Eclipse. Uh, you can also use Maven uh, GAE colon deploy if you have the GAE Maven plugin. And you just set a few settings here uh, with your application ID and a version number and then hit deploy and it pushes your code out. It's a very powerful and easy way uh, to, get, to get your code into production. So that is the um, that wraps up the, the toolkit, what's in the toolkit itself. Now I want to talk about how GWT helps you write high performance applications. There's uh, several, different, several different things that the GWT compiler does for us. We're going to talk about them each individually here. Um, the caching, I'll just say a little bit about that. This is, uh, GWT has a system for keeping track of your file versions, so it enables you to upgrade your application but still enables proxy servers to cache your application resources. The client bundle, we'll talk about in a second. Uh, developer go to guided code splitting, et cetera. Let's just go through these. So one of the big things you can see in a, in a typical non-rich web application is the amount of time it takes to pull each image on the page. And it adds a lot of latency to your applications. Uh, what the GWT compiler will do for you is automatically bundle all of your images together into one single image request. And then it uses the CSS spriting technique to calculate the little crops, um, to crop each image and display the, the part of the image from the one image. And all of that you get for free. It doesn't uh, require any additional coding work. You just declare an interface for your images the way you normally do in GWT and it will do all the calculations and cropping for you automatically. Uh, it's a very convenient feature. So you can get rid of something like this where you're pulling them each down individually and just have replace all that with a single image download. Another thing that the compiler does to optimize your application is deferred binding. And this is saying, instead of having to write a statement like, if IE then, if Firefox then, if Chrome then, et cetera, what it will do is actually compile the appropriate JavaScript for the specific version of the browser. It actually, the GWT compiler makes a, a version of your application for each of the supported browsers. And then at runtime, the very first request that comes from the JavaScript is a browser detect, and it goes back to the server and says, get me the JavaScript for this browser. Okay, and by doing that, you can eliminate uh, the time associated with all those late binding calculations, the if-thens for browser detect, but you can also have the most efficient implementation of a given function for that browser. So for example, if we use the set inner text method and we create an a, a implementation that's optimized for each browser, then we can get some performance gains on that browser versus the others. So you get kind of the best of both worlds again here. You can have the most implementation for the most efficient impl for a browser, but not have to worry about all that yourself. And then most importantly, the GWT compiler does a lot of code elimination for you so that you don't have unused code at all. First of all, it will shrink your code using obfuscation. So it basically turns a nice, um, otherwise pretty readable Java code into something that's completely unintelligible <laughs> in JavaScript, um, but very small. You can actually change that mode in the compiler if you want to see the JavaScript that it's generating and be able to understand it, you can tell it to generate pretty or detailed uh, code as well, but obfuscation will shrink it by default. You also get uh, modularization. So if you're going to use another widget library like Dojo or YUI, 
you have to pull down a JavaScript for each feature that you want to use, typically. But even within that JavaScript, there will be some features that you're not actually using in the JavaScript. So you're, you're having to pay the size penalty to download it, whether you actually exercise all the code in that library or not. What the GWT compiler does for you is it removes any code in your application that's not reachable. So you can use as many third-party libraries as you want, but it only compiles to JavaScript the code that is actually used in your application. So the compiler automatically does what would take you a long time uh, to do by hand, a very careful analysis, and it does that for you automatically. So it produces the smallest possible JavaScript that you can have uh, containing just the code that you, you actually need. Uh, there's some other optimizations, constant folding and method inlining and things like that that it does. And then it also gives you the capability to do developer-guided code splitting. So if you, you can set split points in your code, they're called, and then the GWT compiler uh, will break your program up into multiple JavaScripts. So instead of having to download the entire application when you initially load the page, you can download just what's necessary to show the first page, for example. And then as the user clicks through to different features, it can go retrieve more JavaScript to execute those features. Depending on the kind of application you have, that may, may be helpful. But the important thing is the compiler does it for you automatically. You just set the split point, and then it goes and figures, it walks the entire call hierarchy to figure out all the code that belongs to that split point, and then bundles it up into a single JavaScript. So let me move on to some of the new features that are in uh, 2.1, which came out just a few weeks ago. We have the integration with Spring Roo, uh, which was demoed earlier this morning. There's a new feature to assist your apps with security called Safe HTML Wrappers. Um, this is just a, a class which does some escaping of the characters which are vulnerable to cross-site scripting. So anytime you're going to be calling a dangerous method in the browser, like set inner text, you should wrap it in a safe HTML, and GWT will do the escaping of the dangerous characters for you. There is better Maven support now. Uh, looks like there's supposed to be a bullet right there between GPE and Request Factory. Uh, the better Maven support in GPE, now you can actually, if you import a Maven project into Google plugin for Eclipse, it will actually read the Maven POM file and then build out your whole project there in Eclipse from the Maven POM file. It, it, it's using uh, M2 Eclipse as well as stuff that we wrote on top of that. Um, it, it used to be you couldn't really use Google plugin for Eclipse if you were using Maven, and we've solved that now. Request Factory, uh, we'll get to in just a minute, is a new service layer. Activities and Places uh, is GWT 2.1's support for the model view presenter pattern. And then there's a new thing called Cell Widgets as well, and built-in logging. So I've got a couple of slides on each of those. By way of uh, review, if you've used GWT before, you know there were three flavors of RPC that you could do previously. You could use the Request Builder class uh, to make a request for either JSON or XML, and then parse that. And the easiest way has always been GWT RPC. GWT RPC um, allows you to send and receive plain old Java objects to and from the server. So you just write an interface that defines your service, and you can send any type of domain object to the server. The GWT compiler actually will generate the serializers and deserializer classes that are necessary uh, to convert that Java object to JavaScript and transmit and receive the JavaScript. And you don't have to worry about any of that. So GWT RPC is very, very easy, very powerful. Uh, it supports polymorphism, so you can declare a return type on a, a service method, for example, that says, uh, I want to get back an animal, and you might get back a cat or a dog, and that just works. In GWT 2.1, we've now created a new service layer called the Request Factory, 
And this is designed especially for data-oriented services. The RPC mechanism is a generic service layer. You can use it to implement any kind of service. Uh, but there's a lot of things that you end up doing the same way for services which are specifically data-oriented. So the request factory uh, gives you a higher level of abstraction that can be used for batching and caching um, as we move forward with it in future versions. It's even faster than GWT RPC uh, because it's based on JSON and doesn't require the GWT compiler to create all the serializers and deserializers that used to be required. And very importantly, it tracks the changes on the client that you make to your objects and then automatically sends only the deltas or differences to the server. And so that's functionality that you no longer have to think about. Um, if you use the request factory model, then GWT will take care of that for you. We've added first class support for the model view presenter pattern. How many people are familiar with the model view presenter? Okay, quite a few. If you want to learn more about that, um, I recommend that you go to the Google I.O. talks from 2009 and 2010. There's presentations there that will uh, explain it further. There's also some articles on the GWT documentation site specifically on how to use MVP. But MVP is similar to Model View Controller for server-side applications. It gives you a lot more uh, manageability to your code and kind of prevents the spaghetti code, which otherwise uh, happens as your interfaces get larger. So in, in 2.1 MVP, a view is actually going to be an interface rather than an implementation. And by defining the view as an interface, then you can test it by creating mock objects for the view and not have to uh, instantiate the GWT test case class to do that. This is important if you've done any GWT testing. Um, you know that GWT test case, it's a very powerful class, but it actually fires up a browser, headless browser, um, to run the test cases in a simulated browser environment. And it's, it's expensive to, to do that. It takes a lot of time. So we would like to be able to just run plain old JUnit tests. And by creating a view as an interface, you can do that. In general, by uh, using the MVP pattern, that's one of the benefits is testability. So your view will be an interface with implementations then uh, that actually have all the widget code in them. Your, uh, in, in the way of thinking in 2.1, your views are typically uh, reusable because your view code is what spends most of the time in the browser. Actually creating widgets and instantiating them is interacting with the DOM. So we typically try to obtain views from some kind of factory object where they get created once at startup and then are available after that. Uh, the presenter contains no widgets at all. It's just business logic. And like a controller, it's the gateway between your services and your widget code. Now activities are similar to a presenter concept for those familiar with uh, MVP, but an activity, it's named the same and works somewhat the same as an activity on an Android. It represents a user activity, and you can write an activity in GWT 2.1 and just implement the activity interface. It has just a couple of methods. And uh, some of the things it will do for you is automatically warn users before you leave an activity. So if the user uh, hits the back button, uh, it will automatically get intercepted by the the GWT code and pop a warning at your, if you tell it to, you can also turn that off. That says you're about to leave this activity. The activity's responsibility is to instantiate the view and then maintain the state of the user's actions. And activities are mapped from places. Places are essentially the bookmarkable state of an activity. So if you've written Ajax applications before, you know one, one problem is that you have this nice application running, 
and there's all kinds of things going on, and it's very responsive in, in responding to user actions, and then your user goes and clicks the back button, and what happens? It goes back to whatever page they were looking at before they started working with your application because they've unloaded the JavaScript that was your application. So GWT provides a history object which allows you to manage this, and within your application, you can serialize the state of what's going on into some kind of a string token, put that token on the URL, and then when they hit the back button, they're just going back to a previous token, and they will still be in your application. It works more like you would expect it to work as a user, not as you would expect it to work as a programmer. As a programmer, you know that, oh, you're gonna go back to whatever HTML page you were viewing before that, but users don't like that. So in GWT 2.1, it's very easy to create this behavior now. You can make place objects, which represent the state of an activity, and then there's a place controller that maps uh, your places to the actual tokens in the bookmark. And if you wire it up correctly, then as the user navigates, it all works, keeps track of their places, and it all just works for you. In order to, uh, to tell it how to save your place on the URL, you create a, something called a place tokenizer that just has a method that converts a place to a string and vice versa. In 2.1, we've also added cell widgets, and these provide fast, lightweight table rendering. Um, one of the issues people have requested for a long time is we want to show a million rows of data um, or even 10,000 rows, but all on one screen. How do we do that? So cell widgets and cell tables now provide uh, very fast, lightweight rendering. They also provide data binding features through data providers and value updaters so that you can, you can bind a table. I think we've got an example come up here, actually. You can describe your, your data in terms of things like this text column, uh, which takes a contact object. And then this will tell the table renderer that to use the name field of the, for that column. And then down here, we're going to use the address field for the next column. Now, if you combine this kind of description with value updaters and data providers, then you can have the table automatically uh, query the server for new data and then call the appropriate methods like here uh, to, get, to extract the name, address, et cetera. Let me back up that. Also, there are paging controls now. Uh, the, automatically, again, you, you define the data provider and then you put the paging controls on the page to go first page, next page, last page, et cetera. And GWT will do all that for you. It will make asynchronous calls to your server to retrieve new data when the user clicks those buttons. And that used to be stuff that you had to wire up uh, much more manually. Okay, logging has been in a, was available through the GWT log project previously, but GWT now has the Java util logging emulation built in. So you can just uh, put it in your uh, GWT.xml file and call it using the Java util logging API. And what's really nice is you can set this property, GWT.logging.simple remote handler, and actually log on the server as well as the client without you having, again, to write all that manually. We have just a couple minutes to talk about tips and tricks. And then uh, there's, I'm going to ask Tomas to show uh, an example of a GWT application that he's built. And hopefully the internet will be working by the time <laughs> that gets up on screen. Uh, so two of the questions that I frequently hear uh, from people who've started to use GWT and make large projects with it are how do I speed up the compile uh, and how do I shrink my app? So the compile report is the first thing that I want to make sure that you see. If you pass this flag to the GWT compiler, which you can do very easily in Eclipse, 
when you click the compile button for your code, you have the advanced uh, options and all you have to do is just add it there. So a compile report will produce for you a nice HTML uh, report like the one shown here that will give you a breakdown of all your code um, by package and the size of the resulting JavaScript associated with that code. And this will also show you if you've created split points to divide your code up into multiple JavaScript modules, it'll show you how big is each split point. So you know how much benefit you're getting by uh, splitting it up. So that's, that's one way that you can shrink your app is by eliminating code that, or refactoring it to use more common modules so you're not doing everything a different way, for example. And then the second thing is to speed up compilation. And we have projects that as they get larger, it takes longer and longer to do a full compile. And the reason for this is because GWT tries to make the user experience as fast as possible. So things like deferred binding, uh, where we're generating code that's specific to each browser. It takes time to create a JavaScript permutation for each browser, and if you're using multi-language, each language. So what we can do is use the uh, dash draft compile option, and that will skip some of the optimizations that take time. And you wouldn't want to do this before going to final production because you want those optimizations there. But if you're just in development mode, do a draft compile. And that'll go, in some cases, like 10 times faster. As your project gets larger, you'll appreciate that. There's also a way to set a property in your git.xml that will specify only one browser instead of the six. And so then it just creates the one browser permutation, and that'll save you a lot of time as well. Before Tomas comes, I want to mention that I'm going to be here for office hours. If you have quick questions that you would like to ask, it's from 2 to 3, and it'll be in the corner back in the room where the keynote was this morning. And if you see me uh, standing around here, feel free to ask. And then now I'd like to hand it over to Tomas Blesha, who's written a Gwit app that uh, he will show to us, hopefully. The internet will work for this. Let's see, I was gonna turn on display mirroring so you could see that. Tak já vás na chviličku přepnu do češtiny. Doufám, že internet bude fungovat, protože jinak bych vám neměl co ukazovat. Já mám v portfoliu jeden historický výkopávkový projekt, který se jmenuje právě dnes CZ. Není to nic jiného než čtečka zpráv, zpravodajský server. Ten projekt začal asi před deseti lety a od té doby se na to vůbec nešáhlo. A z GVT 2.0 jsem našel odvahu to trošku přepsat, udělat novou verzi toho klienta a jít s tím trochu i ven, proto tam nahoře vidíte to logo Headline Reader, což by měl být název toho serveru, který by měl být pro okolní svět. Já zkusím udělat reload, jestli se nám podaří načíst aplikaci znovu. Tak děkuji vám za pozornost. Tak vypadá to, že to je úplně, úplně mrtvý. Takže uh, pro ty z vás, kteří se budou chtít na ten projekt aspoň podívat, tak adresa je preview.pravědnes.cz je to alfa verze, takže očekávejte, že něco nebude fungovat tak, jak by mělo. Děkuju.